Good morning, and thank you for worshiping with Orchard Ridge United Church of Christ. We are grateful that you have chosen to share your time with us this morning. As we gather, let us reach out and welcome those who might be worshiping with us today. With a text or an email or a comment on Facebook, let your friends and family members know that you are here and that you are holding space for them in this sacred community. Today, we have a special worship service that was a vision of our racial justice mission team. In it, we share stories of faith, values, and action. In the wake of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death on Friday, these stories feel all the more resonant. May we offer our stories in honor of her lifelong work of justice and equity. I thank all of today's participants for sharing their lives and stories as part of today's worship. Following worship today, we invite you to a special session of Java and Jesus at 11 o'clock on Zoom. Vance Ashby will lead an exercise in discovering privilege. The Zoom link for this is in the worship resources email. And a reminder that there will be no virtual coffee hour today so that all can participate in this Java and Jesus event. A reminder that um, our September Compassion Offering benefits three of our neighborhood schools, Toki Middle School and Orchard Ridge and Falk Elementary Schools in their back to school efforts. You will find a link and a video on our Facebook page or in the worship email. And as my time here at Orchard Ridge comes to a close, there are three opportunities for me to share my gratitude to you for the opportunity to serve as your interim pastor. This week on Tuesday, we'll have our last of our outdoor fellowships uh, on the Tuesday the 22nd from 6 to 7 p.m. Bring a chair or just come to mingle with one another uh, outside the church. Uh, please wear your masks. Also next Sunday, uh, the, the 27th, will be my last Sunday as your interim pastor. There will be virtual coffee hour at 11 o'clock. Um, and also a car parade is planned uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. for drive-by greetings in the church parking lot. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to worship with these words from Kim Casper. Good morning. When thinking about this prayer, I envisioned walking a labyrinth, and I invite you to hold that image as we pray together. Rachel and Pam's words, which follow, are also a part of this prayer. Dear guiding and companioning God, before we begin this walk, we acknowledge we walk with privilege and power that we may take for granted. We may choose not to see what is before us and our role in it. May we open our hearts and quiet our minds. Generations of American history cast shadows onto our path. We carry despair and anger. We grieve. As we walk, we breathe we say their names. We may feel lost or that we are walking backwards. Maybe we are making progress. When we reach the center, we sit and reflect. How do we acknowledge systems are created for white people and black and brown people are at a disadvantage because of the color of their skin? How can we acknowledge the things we have done and left undone regarding racial justice and healing. How will we reach across dividing walls to make this world more equitable? We rest and recenter our courage. St. Catherine of Siena reminds us the tree of charity is nurtured in humility and branches out in true discernment. We walk back. We listen rather than seek to be understood. 
We hear you nudging us to do our part in creating the beloved community. Each of us on our own path. We will mess up. You remind us to apologize, learn, keep walking. Through our effort and work, through our quiet hope and our walking prayer, may we join with you to find the work for which our souls are reaching. May we seek to understand injustice and what it perpetuates. May we practice the way of love. May we choose to do something. Amen. I can't remember not being aware of race. I grew up in Torrance, California, where there were Japanese American and Mexican American kids in my school, but no blacks, because Torrance at that time was keeping black people out. My grandparents lived eight miles away in South Los Angeles, an area that was predominantly black. Their house was in the middle of the 1965 riot area when I was in high school. There were fights around fair housing laws in California in 1964. We talked about civil rights and sang We Shall Overcome in, Method in Methodist Youth Group. Dr. King was assassinated in my freshman year in college. In the 1970s, I lived in North Carolina. The white and colored signs had been removed from the bathrooms in the county courthouse, but you could still see their shadows on the doors. When I lived in Louisville in the late 1970s, there were white riots against school integration. In the West and South, I was used to being in racially mixed spaces and groups, and also being aware of racial conflict and talking about race. Arriving in Madison in 1980, it seemed very white to me. But after I lived here a while, I just got used to it. For 30 years, I taught a sociology course at the UW on racial movements and politics in the US. Over the years, I've listened to many people talk about their experiences with racial discrimination and insult. For 20 years, I've been in mixed race groups doing advocacy about racial disparities in criminal justice. I did over 100 public talks about race and imprisonment. Besides talking, I've listened and learned a lot. Sometimes I feel like I've done something worth doing, and other times I just despair. The protests around the murder of George Floyd seem to have picked up where we left off after the Black Lives Matter protests of 2014 to 2016. And those protests to me connect directly to the 1992 Los Angeles riot and from there directly to the 1960s riots, not to mention the intervening big riots in Oakland in 2009 and Cincinnati in 2001 and Miami in 1980 and the hundreds of other peaceful and sometimes not so peaceful protests around police violence. As a professor, I've had a privileged position for at least 40 years. I've sometimes tried to use that privilege to contribute to efforts to change structures of power and privilege, but I still have the privilege. I've always been a very quiet person. I keep quiet because I don't want to say anything that could possibly hurt someone. With the protests for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others, and the way COVID has been affecting more people of color, I have struggled to keep quiet. I have always been aware of the racial disparity, especially among homeless people. My grandfather has worked at the Charlotte Urban Ministry Center my entire life. I also reflect on the Interfaith Hospitality Network, which many of you may remember, and how a lot of the families were black. I have also been delivering food for the Madison School District during COVID. I realized the same thing there that most of the families are black or people of color, all of which has helped to set me down the path I'm currently on. I have decided to go to UW-Milwaukee for urban studies. I really want to learn about housing, education, food deserts, and everything else that affects homeless people so I can help them get back on the right path. One of my first assignments in my English 101 class was to read an article titled Black Lives Matter Black Joy Matters too, written by Ingrid Fatel Lee. I really wasn't sure what this article was going to talk about, but I was intrigued. She was reflecting on Black Lives Matter and the protests that have been going on and trying to figure out what she could do. 
she realized that most of the joy she talked about on her blog and the researchers she cited were from the white perspective and very rarely from a black or person of color's perspective. If we don't share the joyous parts of black culture, then we are never getting the full story. She had a mini exercise in this article where she talked about school. She said, if you are a white person, imagine this. You are in a school of mostly black people. You only read literature written by white people once or twice a year. And the only history you learn about is black history. How would you feel? I had never really thought about that before, but it didn't make me feel good. I want to do more to help support the Black Lives Matter movement instead of staying quiet. I want to learn about more black joy instead of just the struggles they have faced and continue to face. First reading is from Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly to, and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Second reading is from Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Don't be in debt to anyone except for the obligation to love each other. Whoever loves another person has fulfilled the law. The commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't desire what others have, and any other commandments are all summed up in one word. You must love your neighbors as yourself. Love doesn't do anything wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is what fulfills the law. I'm Phil Hasslinger, and I am privileged to have the opportunity to help guide our discussion today. I've been, been a member here at Orchard Ridge since 2018. Those words we just heard in the readings, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with we, our God as we love our neighbors as ourselves, those are words that help define who we are as followers of Jesus. Many of us have learned a lot about racial injustice, especially over the past few months, and many of us struggle with the question, what can I do? So we have four people here today who've thought a lot about this and acted on it. There are so many options that we can often feel overwhelmed. 
Dan, Von, Zip, and Helene have chosen lanes where they can help move our society a few steps closer to the vision of a beloved and just community. So I'd like to start with Dan Miller. He and his family joined Orchard Ridge in 2018. He owns Mad City Dream Homes, a Remax Realty Agency. And just a few months ago, he experienced what he describes as a wake-up call that led to finding his lane. So Dan, can you tell us what happened? Sure. Um, my, my journey uh, really began, and it really is just the beginning right now. Um, a few months ago, when I had a friend and a coworker let me know about a, a Zoom um, call that was going on with Dr. G, Dr. Alex G from the Nehemiah Center a few months ago. And my wife Kelly and I attended it. And uh, there were about 400 other people that were on the call. And um, as I got through the presentation and the discussion, you know, the light bulb just uh, went off for me in a way that it never had gone off um, before. And I, I really did um, begin to realize it really, really, really started to sink in, you know, just how much privilege I have, you know, as a white male and uh, how so many other people don't have the same advantages that I do. So um, really that thought process that started at that time was, you know, how can I uh, become more involved? And um, a few of us on our real estate team are, are kind of have some of the same core beliefs and interests. And we, we reached out to Dr. G. Um, he had made a, a call of action, letting him, letting people know that he needed help. And so we reached out to him and just let him know we wanted to um, see what we could do to help out. So we've had a few conversations over the last few months. Um, we've shared a few ideas. We started to initiate some of those ideas together. Um, we are working with Laleda G um, on her Defending Black Girlhood um, work and um, helping out her team in the background a lot um, with a lot of uh, marketing, um, organization, uh, curating content for future social media posts and things like that. And uh, talking to Dr. G here real soon, hopefully um, about some ways that we can help some of his efforts at the Nehemiah Center. Those are just some of the things that we've been working on. Just, the very, just the very beginning. <clears throat> Great, and so finding something that within your personal reaction and within your workplace, you can begin pulling people together. Yeah, and I, um, it's nice because we have a group of people that are aligned in the same way. And I think um, that's where I spend a lot of my time. So I was struggling with how, what can I do individually? And for me, it, it, it became more accessible and easier for me to do when I had a few coworkers that were um, wanting to do this alongside me and with each other. Great. So Vaughn Ashby, you've been around Orchard Ridge for a number of years, and you've worked in many arenas, the Madison Schools, the Department of Public Instruction, the Wisconsin Historical Society, and you have found a way to use your position in all of your workplaces to nudge people on issues of racial justice. So could you tell us about a project you were working on where you had a chance to do that? I was asked to clarify components of a document my team had submitted to an executive board of a statewide organization. This organization was tasked with the building of a $120 million project. Of the 12 people at the table, I was the only person of color and one of two women. After a brief review of my report, which included programs for a kitchen, a member of the board sarcastically said, I hope you don't cook something that I can't pronounce. My response was, such as Ludafisk. There was a quick grin from the director of the organization and smiles from others at the table. In that same year, I obtained a $1 million donation for the said kitchen. That is how I used my proverbial seat at the table. Yeah, and that notion of having a seat at the table and using it to call people when they're sort of being a little bit um, unaware of what they're saying, um, is one of the ways I think you've made a difference in a lot of different places. Thank you. I think having a voice is important if it's used appropriately. I try to diffuse it with some humor so people aren't taking so much aback. Um, but I wanna make sure that um, microaggressions aren't overlooked in conversations. And my, my voice at the table helps to bring that to the surface. 
So Zip Nguyen, you joined Orchard Ridge in 2018 as well. It was a great new member class that year. Um, and you've worked as an educator for many years, including your job now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Education, where you're the Director of Professional Learning for WIDA, which provides resources to multilingual learners. And your team has been engaged in some deep conversations about race. Can you tell us what's emerged from that? Yes, I um, joined WIDA, uh, which is the organization within the School of Education about two and a half years ago. And I feel very fortunate to be working for an organization that is really uh, uh, conscious about social justice. Uh, two and a half years ago, WIDA actually had uh, pulled together a group of people called the Change Team with the help of the YWCA here in Madison to actually uh, work on a social justice value uh, among which is the fight for racial social justice. And as part of our conversations and working on ourselves, um, we have done book studies, we have had courageous conversations about race and our own identity. And when everything sort of blew up in the past few months, there was a need for us to actually create safe space for uh, members of black and brown communities to kind of come together and talk about their feelings and their concerns. And then also our white <coughs> colleagues to have their own safe space in order to talk about what they are learning and what they are concerned. And so we create what we call the affinity groups and that have been going on really well. People felt like they needed that safe space in this turbulent time to be able to speak their minds and their hearts. And what's interesting to me is the conversation, even though we all are witnessing the same thing out there in the world, we actually react to those events quite differently. Uh, in the white uh, affinity groups, as it was reported to me, um, people are very concerned. People are learning a lot. People are indignant about what's going on. It really uh, cause a lot of self-reflection on our white colleagues. But then in the um, affinity group of black and brown folks that I belong to, there's this uh, heightened fear for oneself. And, and there's a sense of rage that um, I think we understood among each other what it feels like. And I think having courageous conversation, both within groups of people that you feel comfortable with, as well as across groups is really um, important at this time. And I think that is the lane that I feel I can help along the way uh, of us moving forward together. And that ability to realize what other people are feeling that we may not see otherwise, unless you have those conversations really matters. So, Helene Nelson, you've got a long history here at Orchard Ridge and a long history of leading governmental agencies and engaging with nonprofit agencies. And you've got a story about realizing sometimes white folks who have power need to step back. Can you tell us about that? Um, yes. Sometimes we need to step up for racial justice and sometimes we have to step back and stand behind people of color. And the story includes a little bit of both. Um, after I retired, I joined the board of the Wisconsin Council on Children and Families, WCCF, now called Kids Forward. And that's an organization, nonprofit, that advocates for the well-being of kids by investing in better policies, systems of care, programs, and budgets. Um, it was primarily a white board, primarily a white staff, and what I, you would call progressive intellectual people. Um, who believed in research for informed policy making? That was really our lane, data and research. Um, we knew about the big gaps in well being of kids of color and their peers in Wisconsin um, and their families. Um, and we decided, using our data tools, to do a deep dive. And you probably remember the 2013 Race to Equity Report, which we published for Dane County. Um, you know, I was personally not surprised by the data, but what really surprised me was the response of a lot of the white community. Uh, people being shocked, people saying it was a wake up call. And I thought, this is an example of um, privilege because the Urban League had published similar data years before, 
all the organizations that worked in these lanes had published data. And who was paying attention to what and why? And somehow our organization had a credible and privileged voice and we raised it. But at that point, the question is, what are the solutions? What do we do here? And this is the point at which our organization stepped back some. We have continued to work on equity, but the question of our lane and who we were became pertinent to us, right? How do we work with other people? Um, how do we stand behind people of color? What does that mean? What are the real issues that other people see? Um, and all that was complicated because, frankly, the political environment meant policymakers were less interested in facts and evidence-based research about the effectiveness of early childhood education or economic well-being of families as a platform for families to thrive and raise their kids. So we really needed to look at ourselves. Um, I was president of the board at that time, and I looked at our board and I looked at our staff and I said, we actually need help here looking at this. So I begged a former colleague from state government, an African-American professional, to lead a team that had a majority of people of color, black and brown people, and um, expertise we simply didn't have to say, what should our organization strive to be? Um, what do we have to offer? What don't we have to offer? What do we lack? How do we work with others? Um, is our mission in, in the right box here? Um, and how do we need to learn and grow? And they hired, the, this team hired an African-American consultant in equity. And we basically had our staff and board moving alongside this group. There were several of us, including myself, on the group. Um, the final report really called us to change. And what I will say is we got a report we couldn't have gotten ourselves. Um, we got instruction on the need to change, how to change, and we're in the midst of still working on it. So I will say this isn't quick and it's not comfortable, but you look at where you are, and I was in an organization that had gifts to offer, but it also had limits. And we are in the process of um, becoming an organization that really can not only ally with, but do real contributions to the well-being of policy and system change. But to do that, we had to change ourselves. Sure. And then, and I think that it reiterates that when we're talking about being in a lane, we're not in a lane for a sprint. We're in a lane for a long, long marathon here. So we've heard each of these stories about ways you've each done something but a lot of you have done more than one thing. And I wonder in the last two minutes or so that we've got here, can you talk about just briefly, what's one other thing that you're doing? And Helene, I know um, you do many things. What's one other thing you'd like to highlight? Well, I talked about the balance between stepping up and stepping back. A dimension of that I'd like to emphasize here is the um, balance between knowing what you don't know or trying to learn what you don't know and doing. A lot of us get anxious about, oh my God, look at the problems. We have to do all this stuff. And we might not know what we don't know. You know, my favorite expression for myself is I'm clueless about what I'm clueless about. But of course, so are you, you know. <laughs> and so I'm trying to balance in very assertively personal growth and learning and in community with others and try and work on this in some constant way. At the same time, I try not just to be a student in my own house, but to participate in some useful and relevant service. Great. Um, that's it. Great. So, Vaughn, speaking of continual learning, you're going to be doing something at Java and Jesus right after this service. Um, you want to just say a word about that? Yes. So, one of the things that I've seen after 30 plus years in public education, as Helena mentioned, well-meaning liberals aren't aware um, of the different privileges they have. But I would also say people of color aren't always aware of the different privileges we have. And there are assumptions made by each group to each group um, that may not necessarily be true. Um, I distinctly remember when I started a particular job um, outside of Dane County, um, the, the director said, and I share a similar experience because my family was poor. 
well, you know, my family wasn't poor when I grew up. You know, so the assumption was, <laughs> it's like, mm, no, we don't share some experience and actually you're wrong. Um, so I think what, what our goal is, is to help people realize what their privileges are. Um, it's not a white privilege test. It's a test to show privileges because of your ethnicity, privileges because of your, your um, ability, privileges because of your sexuality, privileges because of um, demographics that you share, may share with other people. Um, so although it does highlight some of the differences, it really does show how many similarities we have. Yeah, and, all and I think, I think in this point in time in our world, in our country, in our life, <laughs> embracing our similarities and focusing on that um, helps when you are more aware of the things that you have privilege to do. Yep. All and hopefully this exercise will help with that. Yeah, the five of us here went through this exercise recently, and it was really fun to do, and it was enlightening as we went through it. Zip, what's, um, what's one other thing you're engaged in? Well, um, I'm a new member of uh, the UCC Church, and I was asked to kind of host a little uh, book group in my house. And I guess um, in reflection of what I sort of did when we studied the uh, Barbara Brown Taylor's Holy Envy book, it makes me think about part of the work uh, that we need to do is also to really learn about each other and each mm. other's perspective. We are a community of faith, and uh, it's easy to kind of think about racial justice as happening elsewhere, but really in our faith life, we can also interrogate and we can also learn about what does it mean to be a person of faith and honoring racial justice within our faith uh, life. And I think I really enjoyed the group that I had at my house. We really learned a lot about how other people perceive God and choose their faith path. And that in itself is also a way that we can come together and really uh, fight social injustices. Great. Thanks for that. And Dan, I know you've got some other ideas of things you can be doing out of your workplace to deal with some of the economic injustices we're facing. Yeah, I, I would say on a personal level and a, and a team level um, that um, we need to continue and we are um, getting to know a lot more people of color in our community on a friendship level, a personal level, um, and, and taking it beyond that, what we, what we need to do is, as a team is we need to grow and we need to intentionally recruit um, and promote um, our profession as um, a great profession for everybody to work in. And, and, and hire people of color to join our real estate team. So that, that ultimately, I, I believe, is really going to say whether or not our work has created a significant impact or not. Great. Well, thanks so much to each of you for sharing a bit of your lives, for taking us along in your lane. And thanks to everyone who is here listening to this, letting these ideas open up some of the possibilities in your own lives as each of us ponder, what can I do? Thanks so very much.
Hear these words from Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. As we enter into a time of prayer, we come aware of the limits of what we can do on our own. The concerns of our world loom large. We come humbly before the cross that symbolizes our faith and place our trust in Jesus to hold the pain, the chaos, the anxiety, and the emotions we have no strength to bear. Jesus invites us to lay down our burdens and our challenges so that he might transform them. We give to Jesus the persistent inequities and racial violence borne by our black and brown, indigenous and non-white sisters and brothers. We give to Jesus the grief of losing so many champions of justice, most re recently Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but also John Lewis and C.T. Vivian earlier this summer. We give to Jesus the persistence of a pandemic that has brought economic hardship and death disproportionately to those already suffering. We give to Jesus the ecological devastation brought by climate change, wildfires, hurricanes, and severe weather affecting the earth and all its inhabitants. We give to Jesus the political hostility and bitterness that plagues our public discourse. And we give to Jesus praise and thanks for all the ways these challenges are stirring our hearts and minds toward new passions, opportunities, and blessings. As we name the specific prayers of our community, I invite you to add your own prayers out loud or via text, email, comment, or silently in your heart. Let us pray. For Jane Ilgen, who is in hospice at home, and for Robert Prue, who has elected to forego further cancer treatments. For Carolyn Carlson, who is undergoing tests for pain in her abdomen. For Donna Lilithan, who had a bike accident and broke her right arm. For Sarah Roberts' friend Elaine and husband Bob. Bob is in kidney failure and in hospice. For grandparents who have been unable to see their grandchildren since the pandemic started. And for grandchildren missing the blessings of time with elders. For all students, faculty, and staff of colleges, universities, and schools in the instability of this time. For parents trying to juggle both school and work and the responsibilities of life in a pandemic. For all those who are impacted by the West Coast fires and Gulf Coast storms. For greater awareness about Madison Metropolitan School District's two important referenda on the ballot on November 3rd. We lift up these prayers of joy. For 21 months of fabulous ministry together during this time as your interim senior pastor for the ad hoc teams working on a fond farewell to me and for a warm welcome to incoming senior pastor, Julia Berkey. We celebrate with joy the lives of those who have died recently. We pray for their families and give thanks to all whose lives they touched. We pray especially for Jane Ilgen's uncle 
for Lynn Rothy's father, Vic Severson, who died this past Tuesday, and for Vincent Kavalovsky, professor of philosophy at Edgewood College and a peace, a peace activist who died on September 10th at the age of 74. And finally, we lift up prayers of gratitude for our incredible team of pastoral partners who are reaching out in significant ways to members of our congregation who have special needs. For all these prayers, and all that you have shared in your comments and texts and in your heart. God, you are indeed our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear. Amen. And now let us continue with the prayer of St. Francis. close this time of worship together with the blessing of all of our journeys. Pam, thank you for your years of advocacy demonstrated by speaking out and by listening. You have done something I hope to be able to do in my lifetime. I hope your journey continues to be filled with enlightening conversations and opportunities to try and help even the privilege gap. Blessings to you and all you have done in your life so far and will continue to do to help black people and people of color. Rachel, thank you for sharing your insights and your passion for racial justice. You bring compassion and depth of reflection to your work. You have been putting your faith in action and finding your voice and hearing the voices of others. May you feel supported by a loving community as you educate yourself and continue a life of working for justice. And to each of us, I offer the words of Rabbi Shapiro. Let us not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Let us do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. We are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are we free to abandon it. May we go in peace and in power, blessing each other as we go. Amen.